Hello friends, welcome back to the pituitary series. Today I shall discuss about the physiology of pituitary. Myself, Santosh Abraham, I'm working as a specialist registrar in diabetes and endocrinology at Scarborough General Hospital. So let's start. This slide shows the approximate proportion of each type of cells which produce the different hormones of antidepituitary. So as you can see, growth hormone producing cells amount for the maximum, that is almost around half the total population of the cells in the pituitary secrete growth hormone, followed by prolactin secreting cells and then followed by the gonadotrop secreting cells. So we shall start initially by discussing about the antidepituitary hormones, namely GH, prolactin, ACTH, FSH and LH and their control, their regulation and their synthesis and then we shall move on to posterior pituitary where I shall be focusing only on ADH. growth hormone, its biosynthesis and chemistry. So in the long arm of human chromosome 17, it has the growth hormone HCS cluster. It contains five genes. HGHN, it calls for most of the growth hormone. And the rest are not very important. Um, but the second ones, HGHV and the HCS, are primary uh, products of the placenta. And they are found in appreciable quantities in pregnancy. Plasma levels of gro growth hormone, they are binding and metabolism. So a portion of the growth hormone binds with the plasma protein. It's a large fragment of the extracellular domain of the GH receptor itself. Its concentration is an index of the number of growth hormone receptors in the tissues. And approximately 50% of the circulating pool of growth hormone activity is in the bound form. And it provides a reservoir of the hormone for the hormone to compensate for the fluctuations. Hence, growth hormone is bound to a plasma protein and its concentration is an index of the number of growth hormone receptors. Because uh, this appears to be produced by the cleavage of the receptors and approximately 50% of the circulating pool is in the bound form, providing a reservoir. What about the kinetics? The basal hormone levels are normally less than 3 nan nanogram per milliliter and it includes both the protein bound and the free form. It's metabolized fast, partly in the liver, half life is 6 to 20 minutes and daily output is around 0.2 to 1 milligram per day in adults. Control of secretion. GH is found at relatively low levels during the day, but during sleep, there are large pulsatile bursts of GH. The hypothalamus controls GH hormone production by the GHRH as well as somatostatin, which inhibits the GH release. GHRH will stimulate the GH release, whereas the somatostatin will inhibit the GH release. Another important development is the role of ghrelin. So growth hormone secretion can be increased by increasing the hypothalamic secretion of GHRH 
and by decreasing the secretion of somatostatin. Now there is a third regulator called ghrelin and it is mainly synthesized and secreted in the stomach but it is also produced in hypothalamus and it has marked growth hormone stimulating activity. Control of GHRH Growth hormone secretion is under feedback control. So uh, it acts on the hypothalamus. The GH will have act on the uh, hypothalamus to antagonize GHRH release. Growth hormone also increases circulating IGF-1. And IGF-1 will directly inhibit the growth hormone secretion. I'm sorry, the slide is of control of GH secretion rather than the GHRH secretion. So this, this should be the control of GH secretion rather than the GHRH secretion. So it is under, GH secretion is under feedback control. GH acts on the hypothalamus to antagonize GHRH release and IGF-1 also inhibits the GH secretion from pituitary. And GH also stimulates somatostatin secretion, which will again inhibit it. So when there is excess levels of GH through the GHRH antagonism, through IGF-1 and its inhibition on GH secretion and through increased production of uh, somatostatin, it will decrease the production of the synthesis of GH. So the enhancing stimuli are hypoglycemia which you all know and also fasting stage when there is a decrease in substrate for energy production and also there are certain conditions in which amounts of amino acids are increased in the plasma and stressful stimuli. GH secretion is also increased in persons deprived of REM sleep and inhibited during normal REM sleep. What about puberty? The growth spurt. Sex hormones induce growth hormone secretion and they also increase growth hormone responses to provocative stimuli such as argon and insulin and they also serve as permissive factors for action of growth hormone in the periphery. So this likely contributes to relative high levels of circulating growth hormone and associated growth spurt in puberty. These are basically the stimuli that increase the secretion for growth hormone. As you can see, hypoglycemia, exercise fasting, and increasing circulating levels of amino acids, protein meal, arginine infusion, glucagon, lysine vasopressin. So all these form the basis of the growth hormone provocative test. I'm going to sleep, L-dopa, and alpha adrenergic agonists apomorphin estrogens and androgens so this will explain the growth spurt and stressful stimuli including various stresses and fever you can also see that sleep increases the GH secretion so there is a relation between the circadian rhythm of most of the hormones with sleep especially ACTH and GH and when you are deprived of this sleep or the normal sleeping patterns such as in shift day workers or jet lag it could result in deranged glucose homeostasis and development of the metabolic syndrome in the future and stimuli that decrease secretion are REM sleep glucose obviously cortisol free fatty acids growth hormone itself IGF-1 GH receptors, so they mediate the cellular effects of GH. They have a large extracellular portion, a transmembrane domain, and a large cytoplasmic portion, so it's a big receptor. It is a member of the cytokine receptor superfamily. So GH has basically two domains that can bind to its receptor. When it binds to one receptor, the second binding site attracts another, and it produces a homodimer. And this dimerization is essential for receptor activation. So insulin and GH activates many different 
ca signaling cascades. Of particular note is the JAK2 STAT pathway. So it is member of the genus family of cytoplasmic tyrosine kinases. STATs are a family of transcription factors and upon phosphorylation, phosphorylation they migrate to the nucleus and they activate various genes. So they, uh, they happen in concert with the JAK and STAT. JAK STAT pathway is known to mediate the effects of prolactin and other growth factors also. What are the effects of GH on protein and electrolyte homeostasis? GH as you all know is an anabolic hormone and it produces a positive and nitrogen and phosphorus balance. It produces a rise in plasma phosphorus and a fall in blood urea nitrogen and amino acid levels. In GH deficiency, if you give recombinant GH, it produces an increase in lean body mass and decrease in body fat, along with an increase in metabolic rate and a fall in plasma cholesterol. But this happens only if you have GH deficiency. The gastrointestinal absorption of calcium is increased. Sodium and potassium excretion is reduced by an action independent of the adrenal glands. And excretion of amino acid 4-hydroxyproline is also increased. So it reflects the ability of GH to simulate synthesis of soluble collagen. This slide thus explains you the effects of GH as an anabolic hormone mainly. What is the effect on carbohydrate and fat metabolism? So it increases hepatic glucose output and exerts an anti-insulin effect on muscle. It is also ketogenic and increases the circulating FFA levels which in turn will inhibit its secretion. But this increase in plasma free fatty acids will take several hours to develop and it, develops, uh, and it forms a ready source of energy for the tissues during fasting and stress. GH does not stimulate the beta cells of pancreas directly but it has the ability to increase uh, the sensitivity of the pancreas to respond to uh, insulinogenic stimuli such as arginine and glu glucose. So it basically it will increase the response of pancreas to arginine and glucose which will result in increased insulin production. So on one hand you can see that it increases glucose output, hepatic glucose output which could worsen the glucose tolerance whereas in other hands it could also enhance the pancreas to, uh, to release more insulin. But usually in GH excess states such as acromegaly you can see that the glucose tolerance worsens. It could be due to insulin resistance as well because of the increased BMI. So what are somatomedins? These are polypeptide growth factors secreted by the liver and other tissues. You all know about IGF-1, otherwise called somatomedin C. The growth basically depend, depends on the interaction between the GH and these somatomedins. And these somatomedins are closely related to insulin. The difference is that the cha uh, C chains are not separated and they have an extension of A chain called the D domain. Relaxin is, is also a member of this family. Both IGF-1 and IGF-2 are tightly bound to proteins in plasma and hence they have an increased half-life. IGF-1 is very similar, the receptor for IGF-1 is very similar to the that of insulin receptor. But IGF-2 receptor has a distinct structure and it is involved in targeting acid hydrolysis and other proteins to intracellular organelles. It is, uh, the IGF-1 secretion is independent of GH before birth but GH stimulates its secretion once birth takes place. And the IGF-1 has pronounced growth stimulating activity. The concentration of IGF-1 rises during childhood 
peaks at the time of puberty and then it declines to low levels in old age. IGF-2 is largely independent of GH and it mainly plays a role in the fetal growth. If overexpressed in the tongue, muscles, kidneys, heart, etc., these organs can develop out of proportion and the gene for IGF-2 is expressed in choroid plexus and meninges. This slide compares insulin and insulin-like growth factors. You can see the growth factors have more amino acids and insulin is secreted from the pancreatic beta cells while IGF-1 mainly from liver and IGF-2 from diverse tissues and levels of insulin secreted by glucose whereas IGF-1 growth hormone and nutrition while IGF-2 it's unknown and insulin is not bound to plasma proteins whereas the IGF-1s and IGF-2 is bound to them and IGF-2 is mainly during the fetal development the growth during the fetal development that its effects are This is the F direct and indirect effects of GH. So the direct effects of GH are sodium retention, decreased insulin sensitivity. Even though the insulin release can be augmented, lipolysis, protein synthesis, epiphyseal growth. But you should remember that overall there is decreased insulin sensitivity and increased insulin resistance in GH. And through IGF-1, it has activities like insulin-like activity. So that could be resulting in growth. Anti-lipolytic activity. Now you can see the difference. G GH directly produces lipolysis, but through IGF, similar to insulin, it has anti-lipolysis effects. And protein synthesis through direct and indirect effects and it uh, epiphyseal growth also through direct and indirect effects. Prolactin, it's an important hormone of the anterior pituitary. Synthesis, it's produced by lactotrophs and is tonically inhibited by dopamine from the hypothalamus. So 15 to 20 percent of the anterior pituitary cells are lactotrophs. They appear to arise from GH producing cells embryologically and two cells are fo found. One is the large polyhedral cells. These are found throughout the gland and they express the PRL gene. And there's a smaller proportion of cells. They are the angulated or elongated cells. They're located mostly in the lateral portions and the median wedge. PRL is a 199 amino acid polypeptide. It circulates in various sizes, monomeric form, also called little prolactin, dimeric prolactin, big pro also called big prolactin, and the macroprolactin. It's called the big big prolactin, and it is comprised of prolactin bound to the immunoglobulins. Of note is that monomeric form is the most bioactive PRL, and it basically in uh, response to TRH the proportion of the mono home, monomeric form usually increases an interesting observation is cardiac dysfunction and the uh, cleavage product of monomeric PRL it has been implicated in peripartum cardiomyopathy and this could be improved by treatment with the dopamine agonist bromocryptin The regulation of PRL is under inhibitory control by dopamine and it is produced by tubero infundibular cells and the tubero hypophyseal dopaminergic system. So it reaches lactotrophs via the portal system and it binds to the D2 receptors on the lactotrophs to inhibit PRL. What are the inhibitors for and stimulators for PRL? Stim inhibit other than dopamine 
inhibitors are endothelin 1 and TGF beta 1 and also calcitonin. This calcitonin comes from hypothalamus and stimulators are basic FGF, EGF, VIP, prolactin releasing peptide, opioids and TRH. Estrogen stimulates PRL gene transcription and also PRL secretion. Secretion, it is cleared rapidly and a half-life is around 26 to 47 minutes. The secretion occurs episodically within 4 to 14 secretory pulses, so averaging about 8 to 10 pulses in 24 hours. And the highest levels are achieved during sleep and the lowest levels occur between 10 and 12 noon. Thus this nocturnal elevation is sleep entrained and a temporal relationship exists between the REM and the non-REM sleeps and it level, its levels decline with the age with age in both men and women. As you can see the secretion the pulsatile secretion is very similar to that of GH and also the levels when you relate it with the age are also very similar to the GH. The PRL receptor the PR, for the PRL receptor to get activated the have the there needs to be a dimerization. So this dimerization occurs in both ligand dependent and ligand independent manners. And a single PR prolactin binds to both components of the receptor dimer. Again it will result in, in phosphorylation of the jack stat and further activating the transcription. Interestingly a GOF mutation that is a gain of function mutation which confers constitutive activity of the PR receptor is present in a subset of patients with multiple breast fibroid nomas. Let's talk about ACTH now. So corticotroph cells they comprise about 20 percent of the functional anterior pituitary cells. They are the earliest detectable hu human fetal pituitary cell type, appears around 8th week. They are clustered mainly in the median wedge and these produce POMC genes, gene products including ACTH and B beta lipotrophin and endorphins. Since they have, since these cells have rich carbohydrates, they are strongly positive for PAS. So ACTH consists of 39 amino acids and the 13 of which from the end terminus if cleaved forms the alpha MSH and hence they have a common structure. This is responsible for the excessive tan skin in Addison's when you don't have the enough ACTH. Sorry, when you have excessive ACTH. So uh, ACTH, after a short time, it will get cleaved into alpha MSH and clip, which is unknown. ACTH, ACTH is, you all know, it is formed from the uh, POMC. So POMC expression is under the positive regulation of CRH and negative regulation of glucocorticoids. But there are also other signals which regulate POMC generation expression such as AVP, cytokines, catecholamines, VIP etc. They are all stimulated but somatostatin will in inhibit it and atrial natriotic peptide also. The CRH receptor is predominantly expressed on the corticotroph and receptor activation it will increase the cyclic AMP, protein kinase A and Krebs induction of CRH binding protein to the promoter and it leads to increased POMC transcription. In short if CRH binds to CRH type 1 receptor it will increase cyclic AMP and then it will increase the Krebs induction of 
CRH binding protein to the promoter and finally it will lead to increased POMC transcription. Type 2 CRH receptor regulates cardiovascular function and CRH is potentiated by vasopressin and beta adrenergic catecholamines and which will enhance it which will result in enhanced POMC transcription and synthesis and a and hence increased synthesis of ACTH. ACTH is a polypeptide of 39 amino acids. It is the only POMC derived peptide without with adrenocortic function, adrenocorticotropic function. So other peptides such as alpha MSH don't have that and ACTH is the ligand of MC2R again MCR, MC2, MC2R is dependent on uh, MRAP so MRAP mutations causes familial leukocorticoid deficiency MC, MC2R or MCR2 means melanocyte it's the MSH receptor that's the uh, I'm sorry I forgot the um, uh, anyway it is the uh, It, it, it is the receptor for the melanocyte stimulating hormone so so ACTH primarily binds to this MCR2 receptor and when it binds to this signals the adenine cyclase to regulate P450 enzyme transcription which will result in increased cortisol production and uh, which will further result in increased aldosterone 17 hydroxyprogesterone production. ACTH also stimulates mitochondrial cholesterol transport and it regulates the rate limiting side chain cleavage of the cholesterol to pregnenolone. This is the MC2R, it's a melanocortin receptor, okay. So what the melanocortin binds and the MSH binds. And regulation of ACTH, it happens in at least three compartments actually. First the brain and the hypothalamus, they, regula they release regulatory molecules like CRH, vasopressin, D, etc. And it directly regulates the corticotropic function. Second one is uh, intrapituitary cytokines and growth factors in a paracrine fashion, fashion to regulate ACTH. They can act either independently or act in concert with the hypothalamus and thus they prevent the chronic ACTH suppression, hypersecretion sorry and glucocorticoids finally maintain regulatory feedback control of corticoid drop secretion. You can see that the intrapituitary cytokines and growth factors and the glucocorticoids thus help to suppress the ACTH secretion whereas the brain and the hypothalamus mainly will enhance the corticotropic function, uh, will enhance the release of the ACTH. So, And these glucocorticoids inhibited very rapidly by inhibiting the hypothalamic CRH and the pituitary ACTH secretion. Thus in a short feedback loop the pituitary ACTH inhibits hypothalamic CRH 
in an ultra short loop it may also suppress the corticotrop itself that means pituitary ACTH will inhibit the hypothalamic CRS secretion which will further inhibit the release of ACTH and a pituitary the ACTH from pituitary can also by itself suppress the corticotrophin release stimuli for ACTH secretion are cytokines such as interleukin 6 and LIF which will in, uh, activate the HP axis and enhance glucocorticoid production protecting against inflammation pyrexia etc so and another stimuli powerful stimuli is hypoglycemia which will evoke acute release you know during the insulin tolerance test ACTH levels increase 5 fold to 6 fold and it peaks in about 45 minutes which is followed by the peak cortisol at 60 to 90 minutes another powerful stimulator is acute nutrient depression deprivation exercise is also a physiological stimulus for ACTH as it increases the stress levels and increase substrate requirements let's talk about the circadian periodicity ACTH has got both circadian periodicity and ultradian pulsatility when I tell talk to you about ultradian pulsatility that means it happens in the 24 hours whereas circadian happens in every 24 hours so in ultra ultradian pulsatility there are short bursts of ACTH happening so these periodicities and pulsatilities the circadian and ultra ultradian rhythms are controlled by suprachiasmatic nuclei the circadian pattern begins at around 4 a.m. and peaks before 7 a.m. and the ACTH and adrenal steroid levels reach nadir between 11 and 3 a.m. and within this 24 period at least 40 pulses per 24 hours of ACTH bursts occur and their amplitude contributes to this diurnal changes in the ACTH profile profile rather than the frequency that means how much of the ACTH is produced in one burst will actually contribute to these changes in the ACTH and it is entrained by the visual cues and the light dark, light dark circle which is controlled by the CRH also influences it and these factors are lost in Cushing's disease now you can appreciate the importance of sleep in the pulsatile secretion and these uh, rhythms, circadian rhythms and the ultradian pulsatile burst of ACTH. This slide again talks to, be, uh, talks to you about the importance of circadian rhythm. The early morning peak will sub, uh, will prepare for the metabolic and CNS uh, requirements for the physical activity so it will prepare our body for uh, the metabolic needs and well uh, as well as the needs for the central nervous system that's why you have this early morning peak and then it declines when it declines it favors optimization of insulin sensitivity for the rest of the day that's why you have this pulsatile burst with a circadian rhythm and this the disruption of this rhythm brought by lifestyles and social demands such as shift work and jet lag has got adverse outcomes this is because this 24 hour profile will not rapidly adapt to acute shifts in light dark or activity rest and or feeding cycles so this cannot adapt to the rapid changes and hence asynchrony between the meal times and the ultra ultradian rhythm of cortisol impairs substrate metabolism and it will result in worsening glucose tolerance so you can understand why 
the glucose or tolerance is impaired in Cushing's. And even if you give glucocorticoid replacement in people with ACTH deficiency, sorry, it does not restore these physical, metabolic and psychological well-being because it cannot replicate this 24-hour rhythm of cortisol concentration. That is why we are more we are very specific to do pituitary surgery so as to prevent the secondary adrenal insufficiency because you know how how this you can see from this slide how it will affect the person in general to do the surgery is easy but then to have the uh, outcomes to exp go through the outcomes is really difficult so let's talk about TSH again again then now so it's a glycoprotein and it has got two non covalently linked subunits the alpha and the beta subunits are encoded by two separate genes the details of which I'm not going to go in in depth now so as you all know uh, alpha subunit is common to the TSH, LH, FSH and beta HCG whereas the beta subunit is unique and it confers the specificity an important point to note is that the appropriate glyco glyco glycosylation is needed and it it is required for accurate molecular folding and subsequent combination of the alpha and the beta units within the rough ER and the Golgi apparatus. Any problems with the glycosylation of TSH will result in a bad product which cannot stimulate the thyroid. Now hypothalamic TRH which will uh, cause the release of TSH is very important and we will talk about the regulation of TRH synthesis. So it is regulated by which uh, it, is, uh, it is actually regulated by the thyroid hormones. However, there are three main neuronal groups also which will regulate this TRH synthesis. There is an adrenergic input from the medulla which stimulates the TRH neuron, especially when there is cold, to increase the basal metabolic rate. The second group is that the TRH neurons will receive projections from the arcuate nucleus and you can see there are uh, three main uh, systems through which this uh, facilitates the TSH release why it facilitates the TSH release so in weight loss, there is a POMC system that will activate the TRH neurons. And uh, there is another system called the NPY, AGRP. It will inhibit the uh, TRH neurons in weight gain. In, in fasting, there is reduction of TRH expression and it is mediated by the suppression of POMC system and stimulation of the NPY AGRP system. So the POMC basically will stimulate which will promote uh, weight loss will activate TRH and this is how the POMC exerts its effects. That's how it makes weight loss possible. And the NPY by inhibiting the TRH neurons will promote weight gain, the NPY-AGRP system. 
and when you fast there is reduction of TRH expression which means there is decreased TSH synthesis and when, when you fast actually the POMC is also suppressed and it could explain the decrease in BMR when you fast. So when you fast there is uh, suppression of this POMC system and stimulation of the NPY AGRP system which will affect the TRH release. And finally there is a hypothalamic dorsomedial nucleus and these projections to the paraventricular nucleus could represent alternate pathways through which leptin acts to regulate the TRH neurons. In short, other than the thyroid hormones, you have adrenergic input from medulla which stimulates the TRH. You have TRH neurons getting projection from the arcuate nucleus which consists of the POMC system and the NPY AGRP system. POMC system which promotes weight loss by activating the TRH neurons and the NPY system which promotes weight gain by inhibiting the TRH neurons and in fasting you have decreased TRH expression by suppression of POMC and stimulation of the NGP, NPY AGRP system. And finally you have the hypothalamic dorsomedial nucleus which accounts for the leptin activities. Now the regulation of TSH Alpha subunit transcription is inhibited by the TR, the receptor itself, thyroid hormone receptor itself. And beta gene transcription is also suppressed by the receptor by directly acting on exon 1. And it is very potent and it is very rapid and it is evident within 30 minutes of T3 exposure. And this is a critical determinant of the ultimate TSH secretion. and both alpha TSH and beta TSH genes transcriptions are induced by TRH and suppressed by dopamine. You can understand why when there is excess dopamine you have hypothyroidism. Daily TSH production is around 100 to 400 mUs and it is uh, its half life is around 50 minutes and the secretion rates step up and uh, increase up to 15 fold in hypothyroidism. Again the degree of glyco glycosylation, glycosylation determines both metabolic clearance rate and bioactivity. So glycosylation is directly linked to the bioactivity of the TSH. Now again TSH secretion is pulsatile but here it differs that it's not sleep and train unlike the ACTH or the prolactin or the GH. It's not sleep and train. The low pulse amplitudes and the long TSH half-life result in modest circulating variances. So there are only modest circulating variation but it is amplified in hypothyroidism and it is abrogated in critical illness. So there are circulatory pulses every two to three hours that are in interspersed with periods of tonic non-pulsatile secretion. So secretory pulses every two to three hours which are mixed with non-pulsatile TSH secretion. That's how the TSH is secreted. And the circadian TSH peaks between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. And it is again due to increased pulse amplitude rather than the frequency. These are the factors which affect the secretion of TSH in short. So stimulatory are TRH, opioids, D agonist and leptin, an inhibitory, thyroid itself, thyroid hormone itself, somatostatin analogs and somatostatin, D agonist, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and glucocorticoids. I'm sorry the stimulatory is by dopamine receptor antagonist actually and the inhibition is by the dopamine agonist. Now coming to FSH and LH, these are gonadotropins and these are produced by the pituitary gonadotrophs. They play an essential role in reproduction and they act on ovaries and testes to direct gametogenesis and sex steroid hormone synthesis. 
and gonadotropic cells are about 10 to 15 percent of the anterior pituitary cells they're heterogeneous with large round cell bodies with prominent rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus so they're heterogeneous means they, they have two kind of groups that are bihormonal groups which will secrete both FSH and LH and monohormonal groups which will either secrete FSH or LH and cells with LH secretory granules often accumulate peripherally so the GN arch now The hypothalamic control of gonadotropins occur mainly by the GnRH actions. Glutamate and norepinephrine provides this stimulated drive, whereas GABA and opioids are inhibitory. Another uh, interesting factor is kiss peptin, which is encoded by the kiss one gene, and it is identified as a key GnRH secretagogue. And the hallmark of hypothalamic GnHr secretion is pulsatile rather than the continuous release. You all know about that. And there is a pulsatile release into this hypophyseal portal circulation, which results in episodic stimulation of the gonadotrop. When you whereas when you permanently stimulate it, it leads to the inhibition. And uh, G GnRH are uh, the GnRH receptor activation increases calcium mobilization it stimulates influx of extracellular calcium to induce pituitary LH and FSH secretion that's how the GHRH sorry the GNR, GNRH through its receptor acts inhibits and activates activins very interesting topic so they are members of the TGF beta family they are dimeric proteins and they have a common alpha subunit and two highly homologous beta unit, subunits and when these beta subunits form dimers they form activins and inhibins inhibit FSH while as activins stimulate FSH synthesis and secretion a third one is folistatin which will inhibit FSH it is structurally unrelated to inhibits so these are selective for FSH inhibits their production in males it is produced in the testes in response to FSH stimulation and it will provide feedback inhibition of FSH in women inhibin A is secreted by dominant ovarian follicles and corpora lutea and it will again suppress the FSH so inhibin A is mainly found in late follicular and luteal phases whereas in the early follicular phases and the late luteal phases you find inhibit B. What happens when activins are binds with their receptors? So activin, activin receptors, there are two types of receptors, one and two. They basically serine threonine kinase receptors. Basically activin binds to the type 2 receptor and then it increases the association with type 1 receptor and it will stimulate the type 1 receptor phosphorylation which will again result in the phosphorylation of intracellular SMAD which is involved in the signaling and the SMAD is translocated to the nucleus the SMAD complex gets translocated to the nucleus and this binds to the gene regulatory elements and again it will interact with other transcription factors and regulate gene transcription this is how the activants in short work but folistatin it is so jealous of activin that it inhibits activin by interfering with the activin binding to its receptor so inhibins compete for binding to type 2 activin receptors also and thus it prevents recruitment of type 1 receptors so folistatin interferes with the activin binding to its receptor and inhibins also compete for the binding to
to type to active interceptors. I'm sorry, I told you before, inhibins are so jealous of activins. They actually compete for the type 2 receptors, whereas folistatin actually it binds with activin and it interferes with the activin binding to the activin receptor. Coming to the posterior pituitary, here I will be talking to you only about ADH or vasopressin. I won't be focusing on oxytocin here. Let's talk about hypothalamus and pituitary uh, connection, connections and uh, shared it, uh, shared common f uh, you know formation. Actually, they have a common pathway in their formation. So there are connections mainly neural between hypothalamus and posterior lobe of the pituitary, and there are vascular connections uh, mainly between the hypothalamus and the anterior lobe. So you can see how it is connected. Embryologically, the posterior pituitary arises from the floor of the third ventricle and it is made up in large part by axons that arise from cell bodies in the supraptic and paraventricular nuclei and then they pass to the posterior pituitary via the hypothalamo hypophyseal tract so the posterior pituitary and hypothalamus is mainly neural and in the anterior pitu uh, pituitary and hypothalamus mainly vascular so why vascular because they need all these releasing and inhibition inhibiting hormones for their release from the anterior lobe whereas in posterior pituitary the mechanisms are different sympathetic nerve fibers they reach the anterior lobe from the capsule and the parasympathetic fibers reach from the petrosal nerves and but the port portal hypophyseal vessels form the direct vascular link between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary which has been discussed before and these arterial twigs from the carotid arteries and circular villus form a network of fenestrated capillaries which are form the primary plexus on the ventral surface of hypothalamus and these capillary loops also penetrate the median eminence this is why if you have any any problem with uh, carotid artery which could likely involve a stroke the hypothalamus and subsequently the anterior pituitary could be involved in that when we have talked about hypopituitarism and uh, especially growth hormone deficiencies we have already talked about brain injury trauma and uh, stroke where subarachnoid hemorrhage where they need to be followed up if they have any symptoms so that's the significance of this. So this is uh, basically, uh, you know, that connections, you know, there is a neural connection between the posterior lobe and uh, the hypothalamus, uh, supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is a vascular connection between the anterior pituitary normal, so that's shown in red. So the main hormones of uh, posterior pituitary are vasopressin and oxytocin. So vasopressin is also known as AVP. They are non-apeptides with a dial sulfide ring. They are synthesized in the magnocellular neurons in supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. Then they are transported through the axons of these neurons and then they come to the posterior lobe of the pituitary and they are secreted in response to electrical activity in the endings. Some make oxytocin, some make vasopressin. And oxytocin and vasopressin are typical neural hormones. And these have a characteristic neurophysin associated with them in the granules, uh, in the neurons. So neurophysin in case of oxytocin, one in case of oxytocin and neurophysin two in, uh, two in case of vasopressin. They were originally thought to bind these polypeptides, but now they are simply parts of this precursor molecule. So these could serve as markers for these hormones. Synthesis, the precursor molecules are synthesized in ribosomes and then their leader sequences are spliced away in the ER 
and then they are packaged in secretory granules in Golgi and they are transmitted through axons by axoplasmic flow they reach the posterior pituitary the secretory granules called herring are called herring bodies and uh, storage granules contain free va vasopressin oxytocin and the corresponding neurofysin so it could be a marker of the corresponding hormone that is neurofysin 1 or 2 now there is a phasic asynchronous burst of vasopressin uh, this is very important when compared with that of oxytocin you all know when nipples are stimulated there is a synchronous high frequency discharge of oxytocin neurons and there is a release of a huge pulse of oxytocin which results in milk ejection but vasopressin secreting neurons if they are stimulated they cause an initial steady rise and then there is a uh, prolonged pattern of phasic discharge in this phasic discharge there are high frequency discharges alternating with no uh, electrical activities in between so this is a, it's a phasic burst and it is asynchronous so this maintains a prolonged increase in the output of vasopressin where you need really an increased output when relate when compared with the oxytocin that's the importance of this phasic asynchronous burst vasopressin receptors are uh, mainly three types v1a v1b and v2 all are g protein coupled and v1a v1b through phosphatidyl phosphatidyl inositol hydrolysis increases intracellular calcium V2 acts through the GS to increase CAMP and effects are basically it increases the permeability of the CDs of the kidneys and the urine becomes more concentrated and the volume decreases thanks for watching this presentation